Amen. Ain't God good? Come on. And all the time, God is good. Let's pray it in. God, we thank you for the day. My prayer, God, is that you would be glorified in us. I pray that this message would encourage somebody, would edify, uplift, elevate someone's thinking, their spirit. God, I gladly step out of the way, and I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be the teacher today. You know the hearts and the minds of every person here. I pray that you would speak to them in ways, God, only they can receive and be confirmed in knowing that it's you. In Yeshua's name we pray. All the God's people say it. Amen, amen. So I definitely want to jump into this word right away just because uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to need all the time. I'm going to need you to be a smart class today, amen. We are going to be a smart class. Uh, we are a true church. That means we are transparent, real, and unedited. I've always believed that the way that we approach the word of God uh, is important for us to make it applicable to our lives. The church should be the place where we have real conversation. When we avoid difficult topics, we leave culture and society to speak to us far too often when the word of God is what should be leading us in guidance. And so I want to jump into it from this subject today. I'm teaching from the, the topic, finishing what you didn't start. Finishing what you didn't start. You know, uh, oftentimes, you know, the toughest fights in life are the fights you didn't start. You know, it's the fights that were brought to you. It's the blind side. It was the hit you didn't see coming, but yet you had to figure out how to respond. You know, I, I, I was raised by, you know, my parents that you don't start fights. So that's not what you do. You don't go around and you don't start fights. But if somebody bring a fight to you, you understand what I'm saying? Amen, church. Hallelujah. If somebody bring a fight to you, then, then you have a different responsibility to defend yourself, right? And, uh, and I learned from a, a young age that, you know, it's not really about what you want. There are just some fights that are going to come to you just because. I mean, no matter how nice you are, no matter how good you are, like, you're going to have a fight. Every single last one of us. And oftentimes, some of the fights started before you were even born. Some of the fights started from the generation that preceded you. And you're now fighting things that are older than you. Fighting struggles and family issues that are older than you. you know, I don't know if you were ever like me. You know, you'd be young and you look at your aunties and uncles and you like, y'all too grown to be acting like that. 30 years later, you the aunties and uncles. <laughs> and the kids looking at you like, y'all too grown to be acting like this, you begin to perpetuate a system you didn't even know you were perpetuating because you're fighting something that's older than you. And it doesn't matter how many fights you didn't start, the reality is that you hold the responsibility to finish them. You hold the responsibility to finish the fight that came to you. And so I'm going to be teaching from two subjects, or two passages really, I should say. Uh, one of them is in Matthew, the 13th chapter, about the farmer and the field. Jesus has given us a parable. And then the second one is going to be in our first Chronicles, the fourth chapter, the story of Jabez. Just two verses. But the story of Jabez is such a powerful story. And I think that we only focus on the, you know, the Lord enlarge my territory and bless me indeed. And we don't know what was the full magnitude of what he was praying. Because there was so much more he was asking God to do. But the goal in these two messages, or these two passages, forgive me, is so that we can understand that there are going to be things brought to you that though you didn't start it, you're going to have to finish it. It, it may didn't you know, originate or commence with you, but you are going to have to finish it. So let's go to the farmer and, and the field, which is God and us. So the farmer and the field, God is the farmer, we are the field. In Matthew 13 and 24, it says, here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. So remember the kingdom of heaven has a duality of meaning. Kingdom of heaven could mean like heaven, the space itself, uh, esoterically. But also the kingdom of heaven could mean inside of you, like the kingdom of God alive on the inside of you. So he said that the farmer has planted good seed in his field. Verse 25 says, but that night as the worker slept, his enemies came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. So what happens? God sees you, identifies you as a field, plants good seed in you. And then the Bible says at night or in a dark space, in the dark, the enemy comes and plants seeds. Now pay attention to what this parable is teaching us. The devil doesn't know how to identify good soil. 
He doesn't know. He waits until God identifies the good soil by planting good seeds. Then he comes behind and plants negative seeds behind God. Now, please catch this. The only reason the devil knows to attack you is because God picked you. He, he doesn't attack anybody that God doesn't choose. He doesn't know how to pick good soil. We have to stop treating the enemy as if he is all-knowing and all-seeing. He is not. Only God is omnipresent and omnipotent. Only God is able to see everything and to know everything about you. The enemy does not, so he has to wait for God to move first, and then he follows God's footsteps. So the Bible says God plants a seed in you. The enemy watches, okay, God planted something there. He comes behind and tries to mimic what God planted on the inside of you. See, the only reason you are being attacked is because God already planted purpose in you and the enemy wants to destroy it. I got to preach this plain. Stop asking for purpose. It's already there. Say, God, reveal purpose to me. Because before I was in my mother's womb, you knew me and ordained me there. So that means the purpose is already alive in me. Help my eyes to see what you already saw. Right? So the enemy sees God planting seeds and he comes to try to destroy it. God will plant a calling, then the enemy comes behind and plants an insecurity. God will plant a calling, and then the enemy comes behind and plants insecurity. God will tell you, hey, I'm going to call you to save so many people. I'm going to call you to speak to so many people. All right, God, it's confirmed. Out of nowhere, you feel like, you know, I feel called to do it. And the moment you take a step to do it, the enemy is like, but you don't talk good enough. But you, you don't know enough Bible. I mean, you're not, you, don't, you don't know enough. How do you think that just you going to help these people? Aren't you still getting over stuff yourself? Aren't you still trying to get through things yourself? And what the enemy does is he tricks you into being quiet with the negative seed he planted. And he only knows to plant a negative seed after God has planted a good seed. This is why you will start off good. You know, I'm going to do it. God told me about this business. you excited. You tell your family. You tell your friends. You make a post. Next year this time, my business is going to be going. And then next year this time, all kind of crazy stuff has happened to get you to be quiet, to get you to throw it away, to get you to say never mind. Because the enemy is trying to get you to shut up the seed that God put on the inside of you. He will bring fear and insecurity to make you a mute. Fear and insecurity to make you a mute. So God will plant a calling, the enemy comes and plants insecurity. Or God will plant a godly desire, and then the enemy will come and plant a temptation. So, so God gives you a godly desire, and the moment God gives you a godly desire, you ready to run with it, you good, you solid, then here comes the enemy. All of a sudden, I used the example earlier when my sisters, you know, because they shop a lot, you know, all the time. So, you know, you ever hear women say, you know, I'm going to slow down on shopping. That's when you look in your closet and realize you got 25 outfits you ain't wore yet. Ten you can't fit, you waiting to get back to that size. You hoping you, hoping you shrink. Hallelujah. I'm going to shrink. I'm going to lose this ten. I'm going to be good. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop shopping, right? And the moment you say... I'm going to stop shopping. I'm going to pull it back. I feel like that's the right thing to do. Out of nowhere, here come a text message, an email. Boohoo got 75% off. 80% off right now today. You better shop it. Only got 24 hours. If you don't do it, you lose it. You better shop and buy the shoes right now. And you're like, I just said I'm going to stop shopping. Why y'all do 80% today? That quick, you already going off your word. You just said you were going to do it, but you're already back on it. It's the exact same way. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, you know what, I'm not dealing with nobody no more. I, I, I'm not letting nobody else in. No, I'm not talking to them no more. No, I used to date you. I'm not sleeping with you anymore. I'm living for God now. And the moment you say that is, hey, how you doing? Hey, big head. I see you a stranger now. Hey, stranger. <laughs> Right? I don't know. You just made it. Girl, I, I mean, I'm not dealing with that no more, girl. I'm done. I'm done. And as soon as you leave their house, bleep, bleep, blue bubble. Hey. Right? And you respond because the enemy is trying to do this. He's trying to take away from you the desire that God just put in you. He's trying to rob from the desire that God put in you. I mean, the moment you decide to connect to your faith again, all of the attacks come back. 
Just started getting back to church. I just started getting back in my faith. And it's crazy, Pastor. The moment I got serious about God, all of these attacks started coming. That's not a coincidence. The moment you got serious about God, all of these attacks started coming because the enemy got afraid. He knew I have to kill this seed while it's still in seed form. Because if I let this seed germinate and become a tree, once it's a tree, there's nothing I can do with it. Not even a car accident or bullet can take that tree down because it's solid in who it is. He has to kill it in seed form because seeds only die. Trees reproduce. He tries to stop you before you start reproducing. So he comes and he identifies where God is and he comes behind. He tries to bring another seed to shut it down. Verse 26 says, and when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. Now, this means that the seed was always in the ground. The weed was with the wheat the entire time. But they didn't know because it was under the soil. And here's the danger. There is no way of knowing what the enemy has planted until it grows. There's no way of knowing. You would have never thought you would have struggled with that. I mean, sometimes you'd be like, I was never insecure. I don't even know where that came from. Or I never had an issue with myself. I was never a jealous person. All of a sudden, envy's trying to come in because you don't know as long as it's under the soil. And I teach often when I have counseling and I'm talking to people, do not beat yourself up for struggles you never knew existed. That's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to bring condemnation whenever there's a struggle or something that comes up. Like, wow, I never thought I would struggle with this. I never thought I would have this issue. You did not know. What if I told you you were fighting a generational curse and didn't even know it? And because your mom never had the conversation and because your dad was absent or mute, you never talked to the generation before you. What did y'all struggle with? What was y'all issue when y'all was 20 and 30 years old? What did God have to deliver y'all from? Because we pretended to be saved all our lives and now I'm struggling with stuff you never overcame and here I am fighting a demon that's as old as my grandma because nobody ever talked to me about what the family struggled with. That it's, it's a lineage thing. It's something that happened before you. And these secret seeds that the enemy planted don't appear until the harvest appears. Pay attention. Those secret seeds, they don't appear until the harvest appear because he, he planted it while it was still in seed form. So you won't recognize some of the things the enemy tried to do to trick you until you're already starting to grow. Like you're already starting to grow. All of a sudden you're like, man, I, I never, I, I mean, I thought I was over that. But man, that person said something to me, I almost snapped. No, no I mean, I mean, I, I ain't almost, I snapped. You know what I mean? I thought God, because now it's just starting to grow. Those seeds that were planted years ago are starting to come up now. You're starting to see the plants from it. You're starting to see what's happening, and you haven't, please pay attention, you haven't seen your biggest attack until you've experienced your biggest blessing. Man, I'm so happy y'all not saying amen because I preach better that way. You haven't seen your biggest attack until you've experienced your biggest blessing. Once you step into big blessings, we, nobody talks about this. Blessings and trials come hand in hand. There are spirits assigned to your blessing, which means that the more you pray for bigger blessings, you're actually inviting bigger fights. This is why God can't give you some of the stuff you're asking for because he knows you're not prepared to fight the fight that comes with it. The fight gets greater and greater. If you want just an apartment fight, that's one thing. A house fight is another thing. Land is another thing. A city is another thing. The higher you go, the greater the fight is going to be. And so God knows I can't bless you with something where you don't have the weaponry to fight the enemy that comes at that level. It's going to be a fight every single time, and your fight is based on the size of your purpose. Please take a note on this. Your fight is based on the size of your purpose. Your fight is based on the size of your purpose. Not what you have now on your purpose. 
Not what's going on now. It's your purpose. This is what it catches most of you off guard because you may be looking at your life and saying, be honest, Pastor, I'm not even doing nothing right now, so I don't know why my fight is so great. I, I haven't accomplished anything. I'm just now getting started. I don't really have nothing to my name, so I don't understand why the enemy is fighting me so hard because you're confused. You think the enemy is fighting you for your now, but the enemy is fighting you for what God is about to birth on the inside of you. The enemy knows he's seen that kind of seed before. He knows that seed will germinate and literally change an entire city, so he has to choke it out and shut it down before you grow. When you look at David's story, David had to defeat a giant because the giant was going to come from his lineage. The Bible says that Jesus is called the son of David. Literally, Jesus is called the son of David. David is the only person in the Bible who had to defeat a giant. Why is he the only person? Because the size of his purpose demanded him to defeat a giant if he was going to birth one. Oh. This ain't for everybody, only those who are actually going to do something big, all right? If, if you're going to have a huge assignment, then you're going to understand that you're going to have to defeat some giants. There will be some fights that make other people run because David Brothers ran. There will be some fights that make other people hide because David Brothers hid. There will be some fights that make other people cower up that you will have to stand up and say, I don't care if everybody else ran away. If it defeated everybody else, if my mom lost, if my dad lost, if my siblings lost, I am not going to fall before this enemy, before this attack. God has given me an assignment and I'm going to come completed. Now, this is a heavy one right here, okay? Because sometimes you're the only one in your family who can. Sometimes you're the only one in your family who can. That's why it can feel heavy. That's why everybody comes to you for answers. That's why everybody comes to you for help. And you're like, I'm going through and I'm trying to help y'all at the same time. Because God has assigned you to be the one that breaks it. Not just off of you, but off of your family. That's why it's heavy. Because God said in your mama's womb, I knew that you were going to be the child that was going to break the generational curse. And when you came out of it, your family was coming behind you because of the assignment. Because the size of your purpose, because the size of your purpose, it will actually depict the size of your attack. You're going to realize it and see, wow, that's why the fight is heavy. That's why so much, because there's so many things that God wants to do in and through me. Verse 27 says, the farmer's workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted good seed is full of weeds now. Where did they come from? Amazing question. They came and said, we know we planted only good seed. We know this. But that same field is now filled with weeds. Who did it? Where did it come from? Verse 28, it says, an enemy has done this. The farmer explained. An enemy. Now, I, I want to clarify this once and for all just because it, it frustrates me every time I see a post about it, every time I see somebody quote it. Let's clarify it. God did not bring negative seeds into your life to test you. The enemy did. God doesn't need to test what's on the inside of you. He knows what's there. He made you. He created you. He's the one that birthed you. So why does he have to test what he already knows the answer to? An enemy has done this, and I've seen so many people get frustrated with God and get angry with God because, God, why me? I don't know what's happening. Why is my family always under attack? God's like, it's not me doing it. I'm the one helping you. It's the attack of the enemy. The enemy comes to try to get you to turn your back on God. See, if we don't know this, we walk around angry at God while the enemy is the one throwing the rocks. They came and said, who did this? Who planted these weeds? Who, who caused what I went through, Pastor? Who caused what happened in my family? Who caused what happened in my marriage? Who caused what happened? God did this, and we're walking around thinking that God punishing us. It's such bad theology. I, I know why people stop going to church. If that's what you think, I'll stop going too. I know that's too transparent, but it's okay. I will stop going to, I don't want to serve somebody that just only wants to punish me. It doesn't make sense. It's not God, it's an enemy. And what God is trying to get you to see is, even though the enemy may have tried it, I've already called you more than a conqueror. I put enough on the inside of you to defeat every single wayward attack of the enemy. He said, an enemy has done this. 
right? Not God. Verse 28 and 9 says, should we pull the weeds out, they ask, which is a fair question. You ask me, it's a fair question. Well, since we didn't plant it, should we uproot it? If it didn't come from us, shouldn't we take it out, God? If, if we are not the ones that put these seeds in the ground, then we should be the ones that go out here and take it out of the field. And this is what he said. He said, no. Leave the weeds in there. Now it gets a little crazy. Because God, why in the world would you tell them to leave this raggedy stuff in my yard? Why would you tell them to leave? He said, leave or you will uproot the wheat if you do. Now, I need you to catch what Jesus is explaining to us right now. And this explains why God left some people in your life. Even though they were not good for you, they were too close to you. So God had to wait until you were strong enough so that when he removed them, he didn't damage you. I'm appreciative. Okay. God had to wait until you were strong enough because when the seeds are planted together, the roots actually intertwine. People don't know this. When the weeds are next to the wheat, the roots intertwine. So if you pull out the weeds prematurely, it's going to uproot the wheat because the wheat is going to be holding on to the weeds. And the reason that there were some people in your life that God couldn't remove prematurely because you weren't ready to let them go. And if God starts removing people that you're not ready to let go, you will leave God trying to hold on to them. I'm going to preach it. I promise you. You will leave God trying to hold on to them. And God is like, yo, I'm trying to help you. Like, yo, it's not good for you. Like, yo, I'm trying to remove it. And the whole time you crying like, no, God, I want this. I want this relationship. I want this friendship. I want it. And God is trying to protect you, but you don't even know you need protection. So he said, you can't uproot the weeds prematurely because the wheat isn't strong enough to handle being uprooted. And so there were some people where you try to figure out, God, why do you let this last so long? Or why couldn't I figure it out earlier? Why couldn't I see it earlier? Sometimes God is like, no, I had to let it stay for a while because had you heard it prematurely, it would have killed you. Had you moved too fast, it would have destroyed your spirit. It would have destroyed your kindness. It would have destroyed your heart. It would have destroyed the spirit I put on the inside of you. So I had to wait until you got strong enough before I started moving you. So that when I move you, you would know how to follow me if you had to follow me by yourself. And some of y'all are there right now. You're like, you know, I'm in a space where, I'm going to be honest, Pastor, ain't nobody really following God with me. I'm one of the ones in my family where I'm following God by myself. I ain't really got nobody to walk with me. I'm finding new friends at church every day because I ain't really got nobody to walk with me. I'll go if I have to go by myself. Here we go. Verse 30, he says, let both grow together. Until the harvest. He said, let both grow together until. Somebody say until. Until, until the harvest means that there is a deadline. There's an end point. They grow together until the harvest, which means harvest time is separation time. Harvest time is separation time. If ever you're stepping into a season of harvest, you're stepping into a season of separation. And if ever you're stepping into a season of separation, you're stepping into a season of harvest. Every time. Whenever you notice separations happening in your life, know that God is elevating you and increasing you. Now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. All right. I won't plan on standing here right here too long, but I have to give you this. Whenever you notice these separations happening, what the enemy tries to do is give you a negative emotional reaction so that you miss the spiritual thing that God is doing. So when the separation starts to happen, you start to deal with this struggle of detachment. And so emotional, you think because it feels bad, it's not good. You think because it feels bad, it's not good. So you start being frustrated like, God, what's happening? Why does this feel bad? Because if it feels bad, surely it can't be good for me but wrong. Sometimes it has to feel bad so that you can start the process that God has for you. I, I remember when um, my hand got cut open and I had to get stitches. Um, and because of where my hand was cut by the nerve, they could not give me any um, pain medicine to where I had to feel them stitch the hand. 
and, um, and oh God, hallelujah, I just felt that hand again, hallelujah. I felt it, I felt it, thank you, Holy Ghost. But anyways, um, as they were stitching my hand, I almost fell out that seat because it was so much pain. Um, it was extremely painful. It was, it, was, it was excruciating, to be honest, but I appreciated it later. Because even though it was painful in that moment, it was needed for my healing. Even though it was painful in that moment, it was needed for my healing. And sometimes you got to feel the pain of what God is doing so that he can actually take you to where he needs to take you. It could feel bad in that moment, the separation. You may not like it. You may, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. It may be bad for you emotionally, but it's absolutely essential for where God is taking you spiritually. They were not good for your spirit. Oh, I feel that so good. They were not good for your spirit. So when you look at this story, you start seeing what God is showing. Hey, maybe you didn't start this fight, but you're going to finish it. The weeds weren't planted by them. It was planted by somebody else. But they had to learn, what do we do now that it's here? And that's a whole message I can preach right now, but it already happened. What do you do now that it's here? Okay, it happened already. How do I follow God? How do I keep going? I can't go back and erase the past. All I can do is embrace the future. I forget what's behind me, reach forward to what's before me. All right, it already happened. That's what it is. We're getting ready to keep going. Now, as we keep going, we also talk about the story of Jabez. Now, the story of Jabez, I kind of like paraphrase it as finishing trauma. And the reason I call it finishing trauma is because Jabez's story starts with trauma that did not begin with him. It started with his mom, and his mom spoke it over him. Let's go to the word. First Chronicles 4 and 9, just two verses. Uh, First Chronicles 4 and 9, it says, uh, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. The name Jabez literally means he causes sorrow or he causes pain. So his, his, his mom uh, spoke a destructive word over him because of the pain she experienced. Or because of the pain she lived through and, and she gave him a broken identity because of her trauma. Now, she names him Jabez, which literally means you cause me pain. Now, any moms in the room, that's a really bad name. Let's just say, let's just be transparent, real edited. That's like calling your son, hey, trauma. How you doing, trauma? And so, oh, you're just so traumatic. You just traumatize me every morning you wake up. Hey, injury. How, uh, I love injurious. Like, no, nobody would do it. It's literally the worst name you can give your son. You cause me pain. Every time she called his name, she was saying, you hurt me. Every time she called his name, she's saying, you hurt me. You caused me pain. And this boy grew into a man that was called painful. He became the name of what his mom called him, and still he was a good guy. Now, it's important for us to understand, when I'm talking about this, we're talking about canceling word curses. Word curses is the negative words people have spoken over you, and those words are still hanging over you to this day. You may not even recognize that the words are still hanging over you. When, when, when word curses are spoken, spoken to you, they, uh, they take up ground in your mind. Those seeds take up ground in your mind. And every time something negative happens, it gets refortified as truth. So I'll give you an example. One example is, um, not to see all the time we counsel people, is like if you go through a breakup and somebody tells you, nobody's ever going to love you. You to this, you to this. Nobody's ever going to love you. At that moment, you like, whatever, you know what I mean? You just, you know, you're mad or you try to brush it off. It hurt a little bit, but you try to brush it off. And then the next relationship falls and fails. And you hear in your head again, nobody's going to love you. Then relationship three fails. Relationship four, relationship five. And now you're the woman at the well where it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost believing what was said over me. I'm almost believing that, that maybe I never will receive the true love and nobody ever really will love me. And even though it was a lie because you let it hang around in your head for so long, you actually start believing it. You start believing that you will be lonely forever. You have married loneliness, made a covenant with abandonment. And it's almost as if it's the, the thing you live with forever because you've heard it back then and you never rebuked it. 
You never pushed it away. You let it hang there, and the seed became a tree. Now, you know this. It's so much harder to remove as a tree than it is as a seed. If you plant the wrong seed, that's fine. You dig in the dirt. You realize where the seed is at. You take it out. But if you wait for two years, that seed is a tree. And it's not as easy to remove. Now you got to cut it down by layers, piece by piece. And once you got the layers off, you got to go get the stump out the ground. And once you get the stump, you got to go grind into the dirt. And once you grind into the dirt, you realize it's roots that went that way and roots that went that way. What I'm saying is it was one negative word that was spoken over you, but because you didn't get rid of it, that thing has infected your life. Because it grew roots in areas you didn't know it was still growing. And now it's affecting the way that you love and the way that you work and the way that you have faith and the way that you hope. Not even knowing where did this thing came from. come from. It came from a word that was spoken over you. But the problem with that is you believed the word. And once you believe the word, it actually takes authority over your life. I've seen it happen to where parents have said, you know, you've always been our trouble child. You've always been the, tr the child that give me tr trouble. Always been the child that give me a hard time. So now you are living the rest of your life in trouble because of what they spoke over you. You're still trying to get over what was said. You were abandoned by one man, your father, and now you're still trying to figure out what a man ever loved me. You were mishandled by your mom and now you can't really love a woman because your mom was not to you what she was supposed to be. And those kinds of experiences live until we go in there and we uproot it. We take it out so that we can actually be free. Look what verse 10 says. It says, um, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, O God, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Now, Jabez is not a little boy anymore. This, this, this ain't... The birthing room, he's a grown man. He's grown. And the Bible says that even though he's grown, he's still struggling with what was spoken over him as a kid. Even though he's a, a man, the Bible says he's still crying out to God. He's a good man, but he's crying. And I just want to kind of just pause for a minute, parenthetically, to kind of speak this word to you that I, I know that you're good, but you're still crying. That's the hurt of it. That's the part we don't talk enough about in church. Like, man, I'm trying to be good, but it's still hurting, Pastor. I know you say I followed a good book, but I'm having a hard time right now. I'm trying to do what God is telling me to do. I'm trying to be positive. Some of you, you're smiling over your pain. You're smiling through your circumstance. You're smiling through your trauma. You're having a hard time. The Bible says he was a good man. Jabez was a good man, but he was crying before God. He was good, but he was crying. You're good, but you're crying. You're good, but you're going through. You're good. I'm not saying you're a bad person. You're a good person. You love people, but sometimes you struggle. Why is it that I love people, but people don't love me? i a good person. But I'm crying out to God. And the Bible says he cried out that God, would you bless me and would you enlarge my territory? He did what most of us do. He said, as he's crying, he's broken, he cries out. He says, God, would you bless me and enlarge my territory while he's broken? He's broken, but asking for blessings. Because as a response to trauma, we pray for blessings and we want more things because we think more things will make us hurt less. We think that getting more things will, will help us hurt less. That's why they call it retail therapy. That's why people will go in debt buying clothes to cover up the brokenness in their soul. That's why we, we spend the money on the hair or, or guys shop or spend the money on the jewelry or the car. It, it doesn't cover the insecurity. You're still a broken person in a nice car. We think that if I get more, if I get more, I'll be good. But material blessings cannot heal a tear in your soul. Only God can. When your soul is bleeding, coals can't mop up the blood. Only God can heal you there. Blessings don't cover up trauma. They expose it. Blessings don't cover up trauma. They expose it. That's why people say, you know, man, when people get a little bit of money, they start, they funny acting. Right? You ever hear that? And the reality is, yeah, they were always funny acting, but they were too broke to really act funny. 
You know, when you broke, you ain't funny acting. You just funny. Like, you funny as a you, you can't be funny acting because I don't got enough money to be funny acting. But the moment I get enough money, now I'm going to start talking how I want to talk. I'm going to walk how I want to walk. I'm going to treat people how I always wanted to treat them. And it exposes an insecurity I always had. Because if you love people, resources don't make you stop loving people. But if you don't love people, you were just broke, so you were trying to love people to get something from them. Or you pretended to use them. You don't have to pretend anymore once you get a little bit of resources. So getting those blessings, quote unquote, actually exposes the brokenness, the trauma that you're living through. There is no need of getting a better job or making more money if your spirit ain't right. You still won't be able to sleep at night. You still will bounce from friend to friend, relationship to relationship, borrowing pieces of other people's souls to complete yours. Because you didn't heal inside of here. This is where the healing starts. It doesn't start by just getting a blessing or getting a thing. God could care less about that. He wants in here to be free. The second part of his prayer was, I promise I'll be done. Second part of his prayer was, he said, Lord, God, let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Notice what he's praying at the end. Like he's grown. He's an adult. Family now. And he's still praying about what his mama spoke over him as a kid. You caused me pain. And the Bible says he's crying out to God. God, could you keep me from pain? Because I don't want to be what they spoke about me. I don't want to be what she said. I'm not trying to cause pain. I don't, I don't want to keep going through pain. Why does it feel like pain is chasing me, God? All I want to do is be free. Could you keep me free from pain? And so many of you are crying the same prayer today. You're crying the same prayer that, God, I just want to be free from pain. I didn't start the pain, God, but I'm going to finish it. I want to be free from it. And you don't got to say amen or anything, but God spoke this to me when I was studying this morning. There were going to be so many people who just wanted to be free from pain. Like, God, it's, it's, it's so much. I, I'm trying to just be at peace. I'm trying to just be well and be one with myself. I'm trying to be good at that. But the issue is I feel like that pain keeps reliving on the inside of me. And so I'm trying to be good over it and smile over it, be happy over it. But deep down inside, there's this bitter child who never was really paid attention to. Or there's this brokenness that I never tended to. I thought that when I grow up, it would grow out of me. But it did not. It grew with me. And now I'm an adult carrying the same pain of the parent that abandoned me, the mom that left me, the dad that left me, the first relationship that failed, the first ones that bullied me, talked about me, the first time I felt abandoned and detached, the first time I felt rejected or like I was a bastard child. I'm still struggling, pastor, to get over this. And even though I'm doing okay in life, I'm still crying. The Bible says he was the most honorable in his whole family. He was the most successful, but still he was crying. Because you're successful and wipe your tears. Only God can. Only God can. And because we've been chasing the wrong target, because we've been chasing the wrong thing, we've missed where the healing actually happens. And I just, I pray today, I'm getting ready to pray for all of you, but I pray today that, that today will be the day, not next month, not next year, today, that you release the cry that's on the inside. That you release the cry. I, I didn't do this on the first service. I'm just feeling led by the Holy Spirit to do it different. But, but I, I just want to pray. If, if you feel like, man, you know what, that's me, just stand up because I'm getting ready to pray. But I want to pr- know who I'm praying for. So if you feel like there's something internally, that like, you know what, Pastor, I still got to release this. There is a cry. Turn the lights down. I don't want nobody looking. I just want to get a chance to pray. If, 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 if there is a cry internally, I don't, I don't know what your story is. I don't know. Right? And you don't have to know me. You don't have to tell me. God knows what your story is. But if there is a cry internally that you're still saying, God, I want you to heal me from this. Whether it was abandonment. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Whether it happened to in your childhood, you know, um, you were touched inappropriately. Um, you, weren't, you weren't handled well. You... Uh, you lived through parts of your story you still haven't even told. Some of you, even your family, don't know the fullness of what you went through. Some of y'all keeping secrets from siblings because you don't even want them to know. The pain 
of what you have lived through. I just want to pray this over you. Father, my prayer is that you would see every man and woman that is standing. God, you have no geographical limitation. And all of us have been in that space where Jabez was saying, God, could you keep me from pain? I'm tired of this. And so, God, this is a moment, a cry of desperation from your sons and daughters right now. We're crying out to you in the prayer of Jabez. We're crying out to you saying, God, would you do this one thing for me? This ain't about a blessing. This ain't about no car. This ain't about no house. God, that stuff will come. I'm not worried about that. God, we want our souls. God, as David said, you restore my soul. My prayer, God, is that souls are being restored right now. God, that they are releasing the offenders. They're releasing the ones that did it, the person that lied, the person that mishandled them, the person that abused them, the person that touched them, they're releasing it right now. I see the, I see the baby girl crying and, and crouching in the corner. I, I, I pray over her right now, Lord God, the one who is still, she's a woman now, but the little girl is still there hurting. I pray for her. I pray for the man who has felt overlooked and had a hard time being able to release his emotion because he doesn't have a safe place. He can't even tell people he's hurting or he's broken right now without the fear of being looked down on that without the fear of being viewed as a weak man or not able to stand on his own. I pray for every man and woman right now who is crying with the prayer of Jabez saying, God, could you, could you be with me and keep me from pain? Restore me. Restore the joy of my salvation. Restore where it is, God, the identity of my childhood. Restore everything that the enemy tried to take from me. Restore everything that the canker worm and the palmer worm has stole. Restore everything that the enemy tried to use to tear me down and cause me to lose my identity and cause me to lose my purpose. I was stronger than this. I was happier than this. I was better than this. But what I'm going through has caused me to lose something. My prayer, God, is that they will find everything they lost. That they will find every part of their identity that they lost. My prayer is that, God, that they would not just come here for a church experience before a God encounter. That every person here would know, God, that you came to meet them about the pain that they've lived through. You came to meet them about the hurt they've lived through. You came to meet them about the parts of their story they haven't even been able to tell. Some of them still can't tell the fullness of their story because when they think about it, tears start to flow. When they think about it, they, they almost turn back into what that child was again. But I pray, I pray, God, that you would keep them from pain, that it ends now. They didn't start to fight, but they finishing it right now. They didn't start it, but they finishing it. They didn't start, it happened to them, but they now have the responsibility to walk out of that prison, to walk out of that jail cell and to say, God, what happened to me is not going to kill keep me bondage and hold me captive for the rest of my life that you would keep them from pain I pray this prayer of Jabez over them oh God would you increase them would you increase us and enlarge our territory may you be with us every day of our life that you would keep us from harm so that we won't have to always experience pain. I pray for healing. For you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the God that healeth thee. I speak supernatural healing over them now. I speak broken identities made whole. I speak lies being exposed and the truth being revealed. I speak it right now in the name of Yeshua. I speak by the authority of God that sons and daughters are walking out of here with their heads held high knowing that the Father met me in this place that I don't have to walk in the pain of my past but I can walk in the promise of my future that I can stand in everything that God has given to me. I stand it and I speak that it is so. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.